<laughs> it's always fun to jump into a new series, and uh, the book of Ruth is no exception to that. It's a wonderful story of redemption that points straight to one person, God's one and only son, Jesus Christ. And there are really two big themes that we'll see over and over in this book. Two big themes that continue to come out. One is this idea of kindness. And it's actually a Hebrew word called hesed. And if I were more Hebrew, I would say it better. It's You really want to uh, accentuate the H because it's like this <sighs> hesed. So that kind of love. And then it's also this idea of redemption. So we have kindness, this hesed love of God, and then this redemption, restoration that we will see over and over through the book. And so it is a narrative and you won't find Jesus in it mentioned at all because it's an Old Testament book written in Hebrew, but yet it points to Jesus, the Redeemer to come. And it points to him over and over again in many different ways. And it's really exciting as we see that. But as we get into it, it starts out with this famine, with tragedy. And God works even in the midst of pain through the lives of this family. And he brings about good. And by the end of the book, we see how God weaves it all together. Weaves it all together so that we can see his power, not only on display, but in motion. How he uses hard things in his providence to bring about good. And so we will see those themes his sovereignty, his wisdom, his kindness, his covenant kindness. And they're often expressed in kindness from others to others, from people to people. And so I'm sure that we have all in this room endured our share of hard times, our share of trials, hard circumstances. And I'm sure that you have asked and I have asked, but why? Why does God allow hard things to happen? Why does God allow these hard things to happen? Why does God allow children to be killed? Why does God allow for anyone to die? And Ruth helps us have a sense of how God uses these very difficult situations and circumstances to draw others to himself, to redeem them from brokenness. And so this book really is best to read in one sitting. And so I would encourage you to do that. It takes about 20 minutes. It's not hard. You know, in my Bible, it's that much, you know, so two pages. Uh, well, four technically, right? Because it's on both sides. But it's not very much. And so if you sit down and read it all together, it's so good because you see from the tragedy all the way to the redemption at the end. And unfortunately, we won't study it that way. So we're not going to read all of it today. I want to break it down much more than that. But I would encourage you to do that this week. Just read the whole story. Let it come together. Let it come alive. And maybe even multiple times as we study through this in the coming weeks. Uh, we don't know who wrote the book, but Jewish tradition credits Samuel as a possible author. And it's plausible because he didn't die, as we know from 1 Samuel 25, until after he had anointed David as king. We know that to be true. And David is mentioned at the end of this book. So we don't know from details in the book or external writings exactly who the author is, but we have this good idea that it may be Samuel, but it may be someone else. But the point is, there's this exquisite story that comes together, and it most likely appeared before or possibly during David's reign in Israel, but we really don't know exactly, but sometime in there. And so uh, David, like I said, is mentioned, not Solomon. With all this in mind, though, Let's just jump into the first five verses, and let me read them, and then we will unpack them today. So verse 1, chapter 1, Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. 
but she was left there with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chulion died, so that the, women, the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. God, as we look to your word and read uh, a tough beginning to this story, I think most of us know the ending, but yet this doesn't make it any easier. And so God, would you just help us to wrestle through tragedy? Would you help us to see what it meant to move to Moab from Bethlehem and how that applies to our lives today. Spirit of God, I just ask that you would put away distractions, that you would help us to be here now and somewhere else later, and that you would speak boldly through me, and that my words were, would fall away and your words would stick. As I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we've got this really hard part of the, the book of Ruth, right? Super hard story. And we're only focusing on that part of the text today. So like, yay, Debbie Downer Day, right? But it's, it, we need to study it because it's where it all started. But like I said, read the whole thing in one sitting because that's how it was designed because then you get from this gut-wrenching story to a beautiful picture of redemption at the end. And it totally helps us see that there is hope, that God draws into this us into this story with emotions at the beginning and then different emotions at the end, because that is how any good story should be. And so here we are, God draws us into this story, and we have emotions. You may have sympathy or even empathy for Naomi. And you may be thinking, wow, I can really picture, I can feel her being left in a foreign land with no husband, with her boys, and then they get married and then they die. Their husbands die or their wives die, and now she's, their, her sons die, sorry. I'll get it right. And then we feel that. You can feel Naomi's pain. But before we get too far into Naomi's pain, I want to do a little backing up. I just want to talk about the setting, where we are. So look where it started, those very first words in Ruth, in the days when the judges ruled. So it starts out with those lines, and it's more than like a once upon a time this happened. It's more than just trying to bring us in. It's more than, oh, I wonder what I should start my story with. So I'm just going to say once upon a time. No, this is important. It tells us when this happened and what was going on. It's the time of the judges. And so this, just to be clear, is a real story. Some people would think that there's a lot of stories in the Bible, but they're not real. Well, just to be clear, this is a real story. This is a real story. It took place in a real time. And we will find there's a little bit of other writing besides narrative in Ruth. There is even some poetry, but it's all telling a real story. It's telling a real story about actual events that really took place. So if you're a visual person like I am, I need to see kind of where does this lay out in history? So timelines are great for me. So throw up that timeline, and then we see about where this happened. We have the period of the judges about 1375 BC, where that began. And then all the way over in about 1040 BC, you have the birth of David, the descendant of Ruth. And so somewhere in the middle, we have Ruth. And you could narrow it down possibly a little closer than that. And I'm going to give an event that would possibly narrow it down, but I am not saying this is absolutely true, but here's what I'm going to say. Some have linked this passage with Judges chapter 3, and if you have your Bible, you could turn to Judges chapter 3, verse 12 and following, and I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to summarize, but you can read through as I'm summarizing it and see if I'm all wet or keeping the details right, because there are some really gory details in this story. And so this story, if you don't remember, it's about the people of Israel, and they were, guess what, doing what they wanted to do. They were doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They're doing their own thing. And there's this guy, Eglong, who is the king of Moab, and he is being used by God to go against Israel and actually bring providential punishment 
against Israel because they are not following God. And so God's been using other kings to attack Israel, to help them see that, hey, if you guys don't follow what I'm saying, you're not going to experience blessing. And actually, you're going to experience some pressure, some punishment, if you will. And so then this is happening and it's going back and forth. And the people of Israel are crying out to the Lord and the Lord raised up for them finally this guy. And we see this in verse 15 named, really cool name, Ehud. So Ehud, the son of Gera, he was a Benjaminite and he was a left-handed guy, which is important as we get into the story. So he's a left-handed guy and he is sent out with a mission to go see the king of Moab. So he's sent to go see Eglong. And Eglon, I think, is an appropriate name. We'll learn that he is a really, really big guy. So you can kind of think of this egg-shaped guy. It just helps me remember him. If, so he's an egg-shaped big guy, okay? And so Ehud made for himself, before he takes this little prize to the new king, to the king of Moab that he's going to visit, he makes a sword for himself. And it's not any sword. It's a double-sided sword. So it has edges on both sides, and it's short, about a cubit long, so 18 inches. And he puts it on his right thigh. So he puts it on there and then he wears his coat, his cloak, whatever it was, over it. And he goes to see the king. And he goes to see the king and he gets in there and he gives him the tribute. He gives him the present, whatever it was. We really don't know, but it was a tribute. It was nice. Okay. Gets into the king, gives it to him. And another thing to note is he's up on the palace roof because he's always hot because he's giant. And so that's where he needed to be. So he's up on the palace roof, whatever it was. And then they give the tribute. Everything's going well. He had turns around, leaving with all the guys. And then he's like, King, wait a second. I have a message from the Lord for you, and I need to speak to you. And the king's like, silence, everybody out. And he, everybody leaves. Not a good move for the king's guards. But that's what everybody did. And so the king stands up. He wants to hear the secret. And so Ehud comes over to him. We know that he pulls out his left hand, and it wasn't, most people weren't left-handed. And so that wasn't to be, a, the king didn't see it as a threat. Pulls out his left hand, pulls that dagger that he had made just for this occasion, out and right into the king, into his stomach. And his stomach was so large that it actually like swallowed the piece of the, uh, what's that called, where the hilt? of the sword, you know, where your hand wouldn't go too far, and the whole thing goes in, and he leaves the sword. He's dead. Okay, so King Eglon is no more. And the Bible even gives very specific details that his bowels opened. Okay, so it was so much dead that his bowels opened, there's a stinking mess there. And then Elon gets away. He shuts the shutters on the outside and he makes for it to get out of town, right? And the servants and stuff, they're on the outside of the door and they're listening. Like it's been quiet in there for a while. And then they smell that smell. They're like, oh, well, he's relieving himself. Okay, so that's what's happening. And so they stay out there for a while and it's like, are you okay? Do you need anything? You know, more toilet paper or anything? And he's not answering. And they're kind of embarrassed. They're like, do we go in? Do we not? What do we do? They push on the door. It's locked. Okay, we'll give them a little more space. Eventually, they go in. They find their ruler, their king. Dead. And so the whole point of this story, he had escaped without because of the delay, right? But the point is, at the end of it, in verse 28, their leader was dead, and now Ehud comes back to the people of Israel, and he says, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So at this point, there was a transition from Moabite power back to Israel power. And that is where some scholars believe that Ruth took place, right here at this very moment in history. So think about how these two texts line up. Malon and Chilion? Those boys could have been in the battle that happens right after this. The battle that Israel now is taking over Moab, or possibly the battle right before. 
when Moab was still fighting against Israel. We don't know for sure, but that is the time. There's this era when the Israelites would follow God for a while, and then they'd turn back and follow their own ways. Then they'd go back, follow God for a while, turn back, follow evil. And they just kept doing this back and forth. That's the time of the judges. That's why we had all these judges going back and forth. And so that pattern went on. And that pattern actually causes consequences like famine. And so the famine that caused Elimelech at the very beginning to think, you know what, I need to find some food and get out of Bethlehem for a while, which is funny. There's a lot of irony in Ruth. Bethlehem means house of bread. And Elimelech's like, I got to get out of the house of bread to go find some bread. And then, so he does. He runs away. And his God, uh, uh, he runs from God as, in a way too, to go to Moab. And Elimelech, guess what it means? God is king. And so you, you've got this name that means God is king and he's, not really trusting God as king in his life. He's wondering how he's going to take care of bread for the next day on his own. So all these interesting ironies, and it seems like Elimelech was having a trouble trusting that God would provide. We really don't know if moving his family was an act of faith or if it was unbelief. We don't know just from this, but it seems like he designed his own solution and he didn't call on God. And he certainly didn't call on God's mercy and repent of sins that were plaguing the nation of Israel uh, during the dark days of the judges. Two other names that are interesting, and we've already talked about them a little bit, is Malon and Chilion, those sons. And you may know that their names mean sick and weak. And so it's interesting that they were named that probably because of the famine. And so when they were born, they looked sick and weak. And so they named them names that were appropriate. And then they eventually found wives and they were still sick and weak. And they had these names that would never go away. So here we are. That's kind of the setup. It's this time, the time of the judges and Elimelech and Naomi lived in Bethlehem. And we can see that on the map over here on the left. Bethlehem is where they lived. And then they needed to go around to Moab. And it's no small journey. It's like 53 miles on foot. And so they would have had to hoof it all the way around the Dead Sea to get over into Moab, which is um, modern Jordan today. And so going around down to the south, they would have got down. And we don't know Elimelech's reasons. We, we kind of know he wanted bread. But we don't know all that motivated that. And we don't know how long he was planning on, but the Bible does a good job of giving us this clue. It gives us this word, to sojourn. And if you think about sojourning, you may think, what does that mean? It sounds like a journey, but it's different. And so it means that you're going there for a time. And so it does give us a glimpse that maybe this was just a temporary fix. There was a plan to not put down roots in Moab, but he was simply looking for provision, looking for that bread. And so we can give... Elimelech a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, but we really don't know. What we do know, they're sojourning in Moab. And as they get close to Moab, it doesn't take long for the next trial to set in, does it? Look back to verse three. So they're sojourning in Moab, and but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. So now let's take all that history and go back to Naomi. So Naomi's just traveled all around the Dead Sea. She's now in a foreign land. And her husband dies. Start feeling the sympathy. Start feeling what she's going through. She is in a foreign land without a husband. She's now a single mom with two sons trying to survive in a new land with no family. You can only imagine the stress, right? Can you imagine the stress that she would have been going through? First, they were faced with death by starvation if we stay in Bethlehem. But now we're faced with possible starvation in Moab because my husband is dead. And I'm left with these two boys that I've got to try and figure out. Everything was supposed to be okay. 
but it's not okay. Husband's dead. They didn't starve to death, but now she's widowed. She's alone. She's in a culture where women were not able to provide for themselves. It wasn't culturally possible. And so she's left alone. And we're left with these questions. Will she be able to provide for her sons? She's left asking those questions. Will I be able to provide for them? Will I be able to see them get married? Will I be able to see grandkids? All these things going through her mind, even in the midst of this tough battle, she's trying to figure it all out. And all these questions with no answers. But the story's far from over, isn't it? What comes after verse 3, verse 4, and there's a little bit of hope. We see a little hope in verse 4. When we read verse 4, we think, wow, there's wedding bells. Let's read it. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. Their sons get married. Okay, so in the midst of all those questions, Naomi finally has this little glimpse of joy. And she sees her sons get married. We don't know anything about their courtships. We don't know anything about the weddings. We don't know but we, anything, but we know they got married. That's what we know. And even in the midst of this tough battle now, she seems to catch a break. There's a glimpse of joy. Wedding bells have rung. It's a new day. There's joy. There's possibility of grandkids that w wasn't there. So now finally, there's a little piece that, hey, this might be working out. Maybe God's favor is turning and I am going to be able to see grandkids and the name of Elimelech will continue. But imagine this moment. For Naomi. You can feel the joy, but the Bible doesn't leave us in that joy for very long until verse 5 comes. In verse 5, we know the story. Things get really dark. The whole era was a dark time because the Israelites were all doing what was right in their own time. They were in their own eyes. They were doing evil. God's blessing and favor was not with them. But there's this little moment, and now just like it came so quick and it leaves even quicker in verse 5. And both Malon and Chilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So we have Naomi again, alone. Alone again. And she's in this time of mourning all over again. And now not only is she widowed, but her daughters-in-law are widowed, widowed with her. We have this mourning times three now. And everybody is asking the same questions as before. My husband is dead. Will I survive? How will, I, how will we find food? What shall we do? And that's where we get to leave it this week. Because we'll dive into the, the next part next week, but that's really encouraging for us, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> Just leaves us like, oh, well, that's a real encouraging message, Pastor. Well, that's the Bible. It leaves us on cliffhangers, and that makes us want to read it and read it to the end. And it's a beauty of a narrative, too. I love that we know what happens next. Most of us know the story of Ruth. We know that it doesn't stay there. But for today, I just want us to think about some points of application now about this story, about premises that test us, premises that test our homes even today that we can take out of this story. The first premise that will test the home, we see that the choices of Elimelech really point to this premise. You can leave God out of the home and still have it all. And we apply this false premise in several ways. First of our, all, in our culture, we sometimes can see a total disregard for God, can't we? A total disregard from God. We are getting along just fine without God. In fact, I don't want God in my house because I have seen stories like this of how God does things to the Israelites to draw them back, but it's horrible, and I don't want that in my life. And so they are convinced that their home is better off if God just stays out. You know those people? Yeah. Do we sometimes act like those people? Like sometimes I just don't want your providence in my life, God. I don't want to go through watching hard stuff happen. Sometimes we think that we can make plans without God. 
and think that God's just going to stamp approved, right, on anything that we plan. We can do what we want. Sometimes these attitudes are subtle inside us. We don't even recognize that that's what's going on. We make plans. We ask God to bless them instead of the other way around. Like, God, what do you want? What do you want me to do following his plan? To guide every decision, every plan. The second premise that really can test our home is a limited commitment to God. We confess to know God, and we would admit that we possess faith. Sometimes we possess faith, but we don't practice our own faith that we say we have. No, 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 I'm a man of faith. I'm a woman of faith. When the going gets tough, our faith is gone. This was a Limelech, right? He didn't trust that the house of bread was going to come through, that God was truly his provider. One commentator put it this way, he believed he was a citizen of the celestial city, but chose to live in the suburbs of sin. I love that language. What cul-de-sac are we living in? Living in that suburb of sin? Remember, we are citizens of the celestial city. That's where our citizenship is. This is just temporary, right? This is just temporary. So like him, though, we, we simply have said that we have more important commitments. And we know people like this, too, not just us. People around us that, you know, I have just more important things than God. I cannot make him a priority right now. Maybe later, maybe when the kids are grown, but right now this is important or that is important. You name it. Maybe it's getting out of debt, chasing our dreams. And we're saying we're still committed. We are all in. Followers of Jesus. But Jesus himself said, we can't serve God and money, right? There has to be a committed focus to our pursuit. And the final premise is the premise that will test our homes is if we compartmentalize God. When, the, when we do this, we can appear like, yeah, we are living in the promised land. We are members of the celestial city. That's what it looks like on Sunday. Right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday come. We look totally different because we've got this compartmentalized life where we've got a God box for Sunday, and then we've got a work box for Monday through Friday, and we've got a Saturday box for our friends, you know? And we compartmentalize. We don't live it out. We, we leave church at church. Now, I'm all about leaving work at work because you should leave work at work and be with your family when you're with your family. But leaving church at church? No. Church should be who we are 24-7. Church should go to work. It should be who we are, how we are, all the time. You know, these people with compartmentalized, we don't want to sound too religious. We don't want to sound preachy or churchy with our friends. You know, we think, well, we might offend them or push them away. And so we use that as an excuse to be compartmentalized. And we really forget Deuteronomy 6, that Old Testament command to families, which just simply says, when you sit down, when you rise up, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, talk about me. Share the story. And we should be sharing that story, passing on our faith. Moms and dads are responsible for this, but we're all responsible for this, to pass on our faith. So we move from these premises that will test or challenge or tear apart our homes to promises that will build or bless our homes. So let's look at the promises that are hidden in this story about a man who believes he can leave God out of, life, out of his life without any consequence. He thinks he can just do it. But there are two redeeming promises that are underlying that we can see. First is God's promise to never leave. God never leaves. God has not moved away. He always desires an intimate, an intimate relationship with you. No matter where we run, no matter where we run or when we run, he's always where he was, right? 
He doesn't move. He doesn't change his address and forget to for give you the forwarding address. He's always there. And we see this from the promise in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Who, what can man do to me? When we leave God and head to Moab, he waits for us. Where we left him. Think about the story of the prodigal son. Where was the father? Right where he always was. At home, doing the work, waiting. He wasn't condemning his son. He wasn't saying bad things about his son. He was there with open arms when his son came back. That's how God is with us. Perhaps after we discovered that futility of living without God, like the prodigal son, we may come back. And we may realize that, you know what? It's better to have less in Israel than to have more in Moab without God. If we have less in Israel, at least we had God. Have you seen this play out in your life? When you take that new job for better pay, but end up neglecting your family because of it? Where you have a new job with a different schedule that you cannot fit in your devotion time, your prayer time, you just can't get it back in that rhythm? got to go back to his promise is true. He's there. He didn't go anywhere. He's still there. Even when we're not. Jesus is standing with open arms like the father in the prodigal son story. He says, come home. Come home. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We believe that to be true. That is a promise that we can build our home on. The second promise is regarding our future. And I don't want this to sound materialistic, but when we leave the promised land, when we leave fellowship with God, we sometimes pursue empty but attractive promises, right? The bank account, the new car, whatever it is, pursuing an attraction. And we will find fullness, but we won't find fulfillment. Our lives will be full of stuff. Schedules will be full, but our hearts will not be fulfilled. Elim Elimelech thought that leaving God and Moab and going to Moab would solve all his problems, but did it? It really just created new ones. New ones. Huge problems now for Naomi to try and deal with. He was trying to provide for Naomi to take care of his sons. But it actually didn't work out that way. So here's the good news. Like we talked about last week as we finished the book of James, our salvation is always secure. It's always secure. If we leave God, we cannot lose our salvation. If we were with God to begin with, we are in the family. Now, I'm not suggesting that if we can just walk away and come back and keep doing that and everything's going to be the same as it was, it certainly wouldn't have been that way for Elimelech, would it? If he wanted to return now back to Bethlehem, he would have had to pull some weeds, probably patch his roof. You know, he's going to have to clean some stuff up. Stuff falls apart. He wasn't there. Our relationship with God does that too. If we're not actively pursuing him and feeding him, we find that, you know, we've got a leaky roof. You know what? There's some weeds in my life that I'm going to have to pull out. Some stuff that's crept in, starting to take over. But the point is that in time, there is a complete restoration. There is a renewal. Now, of course, this leads to the question we asked last week. If I walk away from God, and I stay away, was I truly in a relationship with him? And we know that probably not. And that's the question that James pointed us to over and over again, was asking that question of ourselves. 
Am I all in with Christ? Am I really a Christ follower? Or am I just faking it? So if we are in Christ, there is this promise. There's this promise of an amazing future from Romans, or sorry, from 1 Peter. Here's where I want to land. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. With God and only with God can we have a full, satisfying, and fulfilling life. And then when you die, your future grace, your true future grace awaits you because of his great mercy. And that is the hope we have to look forward to. So although this story starts with tragedy, we know that it keeps going. And it's not the end for Ruth. It's not the end for Naomi. And it's not the end for Orpah yet. So let's come back and see what happens next week. There's so much here, just in these five verses. When we are in Christ, when, stra when tragedy strikes, when we are in Christ, when tragedy strikes, we can truly say, it is well with my soul. Right? Ruth would have been able to say, it is well. Naomi said, it is well with my soul. So are you walking in the grace of Jesus today? Not trying to make your road. Not trying to build your own bridge. But trusting in his grace. Are you relying on Jesus' work of salvation alone? in your life. Remember the promise, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he has an inheritance that doesn't fade. Can you imagine an inheritance that doesn't fade? Something that can sit out in the sun, the hot summer sun, and never fade away. That is his inheritance. Eternal life through Jesus. And he's waiting to give it to us, but to give it to others too. So let's go tell them about it this week, okay? Let's pray. God, thank you for this message to us today. And thank you for Elimelech and how you've used him to challenge us. I just pray that, God, you would help us not to be like him, to trust you. That you will provide. And God, I pray for just how gut-wrenching this story can be as we think about Naomi and all that she has gone through. Would you help us to have empathy and sympathy for those around us who are experiencing hardship or who have gone through it and be able to point them gently to your grace, knowing that you do work in incredible ways in your providence to move mountains that we can't imagine and draw hearts to yourself. We ask that you would draw us close to you, that you would use us to draw others to you and help us in our relationships this week to shine your grace into someone's life right where they need it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.